I am a cardiologist, and my area of expertise is, one of my areas is cardiovascular medicine, and I've dedicated my professional life to the care of those who are ill. And in our group, we try to exploit the things that we know a little bit about, it's machine learning, artificial intelligence generally construed to problems in the cardiovascular space. Now, when I talk to individuals about cardiovascular disease, it's invariable that there's either somebody here who has a cardiovascular ailment, knows someone who has a cardiovascular ailment, or unfortunately has known someone who's passed away from a cardiovascular event. Cardiovascular disease is pervasive. When I teach cardiovascular physiology or pathophysiology, I typically ask the students or observers in the audience, how many people here have cardiovascular disease? Everyone does. It is ubiquitous. It is a disease of the juvenile. Some of us will die from it. Some of us won't. And we just don't know the answers to it. But what we do know is that it's prevalence. Cardiovascular disease is quite prevalent across the country and the world. It is a number one killer in the United States. And here on the left-hand side of this, see in 2020 and 2021, it was a leading killer of individuals across the country. And moreover, it is a leading killer of individuals across the world. And when we talk about cardiovascular disease, it's a spectrum of different disorders. So many of you may have heard about heart attacks. The typical presentation is a mature gentleman. You'll see this in the textbooks. Early textbooks focused on mature gentlemen. I think we're a bit more enlightened nowadays and can find that this disease affects other individuals. Chest discomfort, sometimes shortness of breath. But the important thing I want to get across is how frequently this occurs. So everybody has a, there's a heart attack every 40 seconds in the US. 800,000 individuals have a heart attack in the United States. And one in five of these events are silent. So many individuals don't realize that they've had a heart attack, but they go into their healthcare provider who will look at electrocardiogram, take a history and say, you've had an event at some point in the past, we can't identify when that is. Adding to the panoply of things under this paradigm, heart failure, heart failure, six million adults in the United States, 64 million people worldwide. And the five-year mortality in this in many cohorts is 40 to 50%. The uh, mortality associated with this is worse than many forms of cancer. And lastly, stroke. Again, the numbers go on and on. One in six deaths in the cardiovascular space is due to stroke. Every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke in the United States. And every three minutes, approximately, somebody dies of a stroke. So I'm not going to go through the, the, the litany of other diseases that fall under this, this paradigm. But I think the point is well taken. It's prevalent. Many, many people have it. And many people, unfortunately, die from it. So what is the care and what is a paradigm in terms of the care of these individuals in 2023? Well, you know, there, there are some things that we know are constant. There is the healthcare provider. That's the individual with the stethoscope and a white, white coat. And then there is a patient. And all throughout time, any aspect of medical care involves an information relay from the patient to the healthcare provider. And the patient provides information in the form of what they've said in terms of the history, their ailments, their family history, and so forth. And the clinician has to use those data to decide what are the best actions. And in medicine, there's only two things we aspire to do. We aspire to make people live longer and make them feel better. And the actions are all use the data provided by the patient to do that, to perform that task. What is interesting in 2023, it's the types of data that the clinician has at their disposal to make these decisions. So there's information coming from the patient. There's information that's sort of generated from the patient. So we have the echocardiogram, which is over in the upper left-hand corner. We have an MRI scan, a CT scan, and these data, not only are they interpreted by the healthcare provider, but there's an intermediary. And in many instances, that's a radiologist or the pathologist who also interprets these data. The, pay, the point being that the healthcare provider has lots of different types of data at their disposal that they will leverage to make these very simple decisions, the medications and the actions that are needed. We as individuals can process every pixel in an image. We can process every single sample in an ECG. So we have to do abstractions. We can't look at every single lab value 
And, and so there's information that we necessarily have to ignore because that's just the limitations of the human mind. But that's not the limitations in terms of computers. And one of the advantages here is that a computer doesn't have to do this abstraction. It can look at every piece of data, every pixel in an image, every sample in an ECG to find these complex relationships, all with the simple goal of giving information to the healthcare provider they can use to find out what medications and actions are useful. Now the problem is, or a problem is, that a lot of these models are very complicated. In the, I think the state of the art in this space are these deep neural networks, these models that have millions, or some of them have billions of parameters. And it is, they're very hard to explain to the healthcare provider in terms of, this is what the model has learned, this is why it's making a decision that we think is best for your particular patient. So these deep artificial networks are complex, many modifiable parameters, and are very difficult to understand. And why, why, is this, why is this problematic? So looking at the good with these models, they integrate diverse sources of information, they consider all sources of information, they don't have to do this abstraction that the human mind has to do, and in many tasks, they improve performance. So they can oftentimes make decisions that are demonstrably better for the patient of interest. The cons, so it's a challenge to understand when these models will fail a priori. So a model makes a prediction. If the model is not accurate 100% of the time, then there is risk. These are high stakes decisions. So if I was a patient that I know and I have a medication that that patient needs to live longer, and a model predicts this patient doesn't need this medication, I've missed an opportunity to intervene and to make someone live longer, to avoid a disastrous event. So it is important in these models, not only to talk about their accuracy and how they perform over a large cohort, but really to give some insight as to when they will fail. And deciphering when a given prediction is appropriate for a given patient is based on this. So another way to say the same thing is a healthcare provider gets a piece of data from a very complex model. Several things come to their mind. What, what precisely has a model learned? Is it consistent with what I know about this human disease? We've had medical schools that have been around for several hundred centuries. You'd have a stronger reason to believe that the model will be right in perpetuity if it is consistent with the body of data that one has acquired, that has been built up, this corpus of knowledge over, over centuries. And more importantly, even though the overall performance of the model is good, if it's not 100%, is it appropriate for my, my given patient? I want to just sort of integrate some of this and quickly in the time that I have left into an application that we have tried to develop. So heart failure, one of, the, one of the disorders I discussed earlier, is a constellation of symptoms when the heart's not performing as well as it should. So there's injury to the heart, it doesn't pump as well, the body tries to compensate, and the compensation actually makes the heart function worse, and patients can spiral down, and mortality is low. Patients who present with a heart failure exacerbation, they have short of breath, and what that translates into, into the, in terms of the physiology, the pressures inside the chest are higher. Pressures inside the heart are higher. We can know that with an invasive study. We can put a catheter inside a major vein, go into the heart, thread the catheter into the heart, and measure the pressures. You can, can see, by the way, that I say it. This is not a, this is a test that can be associated with some adverse sequelae, right? It's not risk-free. So we'd like to be able to do this sooner at home. And we want to be able to detect when the pressures are changing before the patient is symptomatic. And we want to do this with simple devices, a chest patch, for example. You could record an electrocardiogram. So we've done a series of studies where we take an ECG. And from a data set of ECGs, we have individuals who've had the pressures rigorously measured via an invasive device. And we build an artificial neural network to do this. And then we can do some smoke and mirrors and some magic tricks and try to extrapolate how to do this with a single lead that it comes from maybe an Apple Watch or a patch monitor. And, and so essentially we build a big model using all of the data that we have from the hospital and we try to generalize that to what happens to these very simple, the, the type of ECGs that come from very simple um, pocket devices, pocket monitors, or watches. So we've done this in estimating the pressures, we've demonstrated that the overall performance is good, Happy to talk about this offline for those who are interested. And, and so we're very encouraged by this. We've validated this in different cohorts. And also been able to develop metrics that determine a priori when a model is likely to fail. So what cohorts will the, is this model really appropriate for and which ones it's not? 
So I'm going to end with just a statement. This is Professor George Box. Models are simplifications that allow us to understand things. Physical phenomena are very complex, especially with the human body. And uh, the advantage of models is they can reduce this complexity to simplistic notions so that we can understand the main points involved. And we can sort of understand the general principles that guide the physiology in the case of, in the case of medicine. But the overall accuracy of these models, typically how it's done in the computer science world, is insufficient to determine whether a model is, uh, is appropriate in the clinical space. And so we want to just generalize this to whole monitoring. And our goal is to generalize what happens in the hospital in the outpatient setting so that every patient, what they get when they're admitted to the hospital, will get the same level of care they do at home. And we believe that we can do this by taking simple monitors with deep learning to get the same information that one could get in the hospital. So that's, I'll end there. And I, I would be remiss if I just didn't recognize the very talented people I have been honored to mentor in my group, because they're the ones that do the work. Thank you.